as we all know, antimicrobial resistance or AMR is the ability of microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and some parasites to stop an, an antimicrobial such as an antibiotic, antiviral, and antimalarial from working against them. As a result, standard treatments become ineffective, infections persist, and may spread to others. Today, AMR threatens the effective prevention and treatment of an ever-increasing range of infections caused by microorganisms. The cost of healthcare for patients with resistant infections is higher than that for patients with non-resistant infections due to longer duration of illness, additional tests, and more expensive drugs. One example of the growing threat of AMR is the increasing number of cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis. As per the latest WHO Global Report 2018, 558,000 people were estimated to have developed multidrug-resistant TB globally in 2017, which is an upward increase from 490,000 people who were estimated to have developed uh, ARTB in 2016. Drug resistance is also starting to complicate the fight against HIV and malaria. Effects of major surgery and cancer chemotherapy would be compromised. I just want to make a few housekeeping announcements. I request the participants to please keep sending their questions and comments even as panelists present and not wait till the end. You can question and answer box, the Q box which seeing on your screen and then type in your question. If you wish to speak, please click on the virtual hand you see on the screen once the open session begins. In the event of some questions not getting answered today due to shortage of time, welcome to send your queries to the panelists later on whose email IDs we will share with you. Before handing over the mic to our guest moderator for today, to the participants to answer the question they must be seeing on their screen. I hope you are able to see that question. Antimicrobial resistance spread through and three options. You can choose more than one. You will get only 30 seconds to answer and your time begins now. Wake up, have a say. This is an anonymous poll, so no one will ever know, even if you are wrong. And obviously, we are all here to learn. So, please keep keep trying. You have a few more seconds to go. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, come on, wake up. Time is up. That's it. Okay. 24% voted that misuse or wrong dosage or duration of antimicrobials is responsible for it. 24% said transfer of AMR genes from microorganism to another. 12% said food chain and end. 0% said none of the above, that's good. And 82% said all of the above, which is actually the correct answer all of the above. I now welcome our guest moderator for today, Ashok Ram, who is a widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa. He was a senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. Good 
greetings from the port city of Durban, South Africa. Antimicrobial resistance or AMR is a multi-sectoral problem affecting human and animal health, agriculture, as well as the global environment and trade. Keeping in mind the ever increasing threat of AMR looming large, a high level meeting on antimicrobial resistance was held around United Nations General Assembly in 2016. The political declaration adopted by the heads of government at the meeting contained a request for the UN Secretary General to establish a UN interagency group to coordinate the global fight against AMR last year. The then Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Chan, and UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed announced the formation of the UN Interagency Coordination Group on the Antimicrobial Resistance AMR. Today's interactive session with key experts will help us understand the multi sectoral dimensions of AMR issues that are linked not only to antibiotic resistance but also to food security and climate change. More alarming is the fact that drug resistance. Tuberculosis cases increases as per the latest WHO Global TB report 2018. South Africa has a serious health problem too. Lifestyle diseases such as diabetes, health disease, stroke and some cancers are among the top causes of death in the country. Now, countries need to develop policies regulating the use of antibiotics in humans and animals, but individuals also have a responsibility to protect themselves. Well, this year, more from the panelists who are here with us today. We have indeed fortunate to have with us Dr. Haley, Haley Yesus, Geta Hoon, Co Coordinator, United Nations Interagency Coordination Group on AMR, bracket IACG, WHO headquarters. Well, let's listen. To, let's listen in. I now invite Dr. Getahun to tell us something about the role and tasks of the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR and the broader responses to antimicrobial resistance. Welcome, Dr. Getahun. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present. I hope you are able to see my slides as well. Uh, yes, 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 we can. Okay, so thank you again. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is to give you a general uh, overview of uh, what antimicrobial resistance and also its interaction into the different sectors and then I will also talk about the political response that is ongoing and required. So as mentioned earlier, you know, this is a simple definition of antimicrobial resistance by the WHO, which states that it is the ability of microorganisms. We are talking here of microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, and parasites to stop an antimicrobial, uh, which is the drugs that are used against these microorganisms uh, uh, for bacteria, antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasites from working against. And as a result, the standard treatment for these agents and for these microorganisms will be an effective infection persist and may spread to others. So when we look into the overall magnitude of AMR globally, well, I would like to start by stating that there is no official global data by any UN agency on the mortality as well as on the morbidity of AMR. However, there are several reports um, that uh, show the magnitude in different aspects. So the first one is uh, O'Neill report, which was published in uh, 2015 following a request by the UK government. Uh, it estimates that annually 
uh, this is like the lowest estimate, 700,000 uh, people die of these drug resistance uh, infections following antimicrobial resistance. And as uh, Siwa was mentioning earlier, the WHO has uh, also estimated every year, uh, for example, in 2017, 230,000 people died of drug resistant TB. And another study that was published on the Lancet in 2016 also attributes 214,000 uh, deaths on neonates uh, from uh, septicemia, from uh, blood stream infection. And another study uh, also by WHO estimated only in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are estimated 34,000 days, 34, days from HIV drug resistance. So if you really uh, uh, sum up uh, from drug resistant TB, from neonatal sepsis, as well as from HIV drug resistance, this almost accounts for two thirds of the 700,000 estimated deaths, which we for sure know that very, very unlikely. So that means we don't exactly know how the magnitude and the distribution uh, in terms of mortality is uh, spread out. When we look into the morbidity data, how many people get infected by these drug resistant infections, it's even uh, very, very scanty. So as I said, you know, based on a much more robust, uh, you know, relatively speaking, uh, routine surveillance data, WHO collects and estimates uh, the magnitude of drug resistant TB. So the latest estimate is around 600,000, 558,000 incident uh, drug resistant TB cases uh, were estimated uh, in 2017. So the CDC, on the other hand, also estimates for only for the United States around 2 million antibiotics. This is only for those who are resistant to bacteria uh, infections per year in the US. So this really shows you the magnitude of the problem at the same time, the dearth of evidence in terms of understanding this problem. So, Antimicrobial resistance, as it was mentioned in the introduction, it cut across different sectors. It deals with human, animal, plant, and environmental. So this is a simple schematic that I took from the, CD web, the CDC website that actually show how uh, drug resistance uh, my, uh, my microbes can spread through the system. So as you know, animals get antibiotics uh, for their growth uh, or mostly without getting infected. So that actually lead to development of drug resistant bacteria within their guts that also live into the environment and coming back into humans either through really staying on the food that uh, we are handling or uh, if it's not also cooked properly those drug resistant bacteria can transmit into human beings. At the same time, when human beings are also, uh, can cause um, drug resistant bacteria uh, for different reasons by not also following um, uh, instructions and misusing of antibiotics or antimicrobials that again lead to the development of this resistant, which again it was into spread uh, mostly in healthcare facilities or in other uh, settings that again, when patients go home, again goes into this vicious cycle of uh, transmission. So this really shows how the uh, drug resistant infections are intertwined you know, between homesteads, environment, as well as uh, healthcare and other facilities. So in general, again, when we looked into the exact magnitude of uh, the problem, this is another uh, slide that shows how the antimicrobial resistance problem, you know, cut across particularly by the use of antibiotics for growth promotion, mostly, you know, in animal, uh, in the husbandry, as well as in aquaculture, you know, the fish. 
and uh, then uh, that could also be absorbed the antibiotics from the environment into the plants and the crops and then you know it really goes into the same uh, cycle so that's why the global response is uh, called a one health approach really taking all these multi-sectoral uh, sectors uh, into a one health concept where the WHO, uh, the Organization of Animal Health, and as well as the, found, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN are joining forces um, since um, a long time actually working as one in order to address this problem. And recently taking into consideration the importance of environmental factors around AMR, the UN environment is also joining into this uh, what traditionally is called the tripartite uh, which now uh, is being uh, recognized that tripartite plus with the addition of the UN environment so there are so many ways that for example the WHO is taking to tackle antimicrobial resistance and one uh, critical aspect is making sure that we identified the critical pathogens that are important uh, or that are likely for you know development of drug resistance and um, requiring research and development so these pathogens were devel uh, categorized into three as critical as high and then medium and these are a total of 12 important you know pathogens that if we don't uh, expedite the development of research and development to find treatment for these infections, they could cause a huge loss of human lives in the long run. At the same time, another approach is to ensure the critically important antimicrobials, uh, that means antibiotics, antifungal, antiviral, and antiparasites uh, are linked, uh, identified, and they are basically you know protected for example from use in the agriculture industry At the same time the antibiotics you know are also now uh, grouped into c into three what we call the aware system the first is those uh, antibiotics who should be available at all times you know the access and the watch group are those antibiotics which are recommended as first or second line and uh, for a small number of infections. And the last group is what we call the reserve. And these antibiotics are like those who are reserved as last resort options for treatment of drug resistant infections. So this is really one uh, attempt also to address the uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance problem by uh, identifying the pathogens as well as protecting existing uh, drugs from misuse. Similarly, uh, surveillance and also uh, ensuring the um, uh, implementation of the national action plans is another important area that the WHO is also working and uh, with along with uh, tripartite uh, agencies, the FAO and the Organization of Animal uh, Health. And the first is a surveillance that uh, help to monitor uh, the uh, prevalence and existence of uh, drug resistant infections and the, what we call the GLAS, the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System. And uh, this uh, system currently includes eight of the 12 priority pathogens that I mentioned earlier that are uh, important causes of hospital as well as community infections. And uh, similarly, uh, there is a monitoring of the implementation of the national action plan through a self-assessment. The second report was released last July, and this also covers nine broader areas. Uh, along the objectives of the global you know, action plan. But what we all know is the use of antibiotics among humans is increasing. And this is a recent publication uh, published on The Lancet that actually showed that the use of uh, antifluoroquinolones uh, and the resistance uh, 
for fluoroquinolones against uh, E. coli bacteria is increasing uh, and uh, over time. So there is no questions uh, overall antibiotic consumption among humans is increasing and it is also uh, intimately interli interlinked with the development of uh, resistance. Similarly, the use of the antibiotics and the antimicrobials, particularly through in the agriculture and in the food chain, has also a big concern for uh, how we handle this uh, com complex situation. And these are some uh, news items you know, that has been uh, out that how uh, the my antimicrobial resistance can affect you know our daily life as well as you know uh, trade and also including you know banking and uh, shopping and all parts and walks of, of, of life so particularly the use of uh, antibiotics you know for growth promotion just to make sure the animals uh, you know are uh, grown without really having infections is a huge task although uh, so many countries, you know, like the um, uh, European Union and other big countries ban the use of antibiotics for growth promotion, the uh, implementation is uh, still a problem. So that is why we are saying AMR, which is sometimes is referred as a silent tsunami, needs an urgent and unprecedented action. Of course, there has been the risk, quite significant recent political visibility and momentum for AMR. It starts from the World Health Assembly in 2015 when the Global Action Plan for AMR was endorsed, which by the way is also later endorsed into the governing bodies of the Food FAO and the Organization of Animal Health, which led into the development um, of the Global Action Plan and led into the 2016 General Assembly uh, on AMR, high-level meeting, and which again led into the establishment of the UN Interagency Group. So the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR, which we call it IACG in short, was established by the political declaration on AMR from 2016. And it is a Composed, it is chaired by the uh, Deputy Secretary General of UN and the Director General of WHO, and it has also co conveners But it, it's composed of organizational membership as well as individual members, as you can see, well balanced in geography and you know gender. And the main task of the interagency coordination group is to report to provide practical guidance and approaches how the world can really have sustained effective global action against AMR and to issue recommendation for the, uh, you know, in including how we are going to govern the future of antimicrobial resistance. And they are expected, you know, this group is expected to write a report on these critical issues to the UN Secretary General, and they are expected to submit their report in May uh, 2019. So we provide the Secretariat uh, for uh, this uh, group with uh, contributions from FAO and o o OIE, or Organization of Animal Health. And the progress of this group you know, so far it has been uh, uh, engaging in terms of developing its uh, work plan and it initially organized its work into six critical areas, mostly following the global action plan objectives, including communication and awareness, national action plans, optimized use of antimicrobials, research and surveillance monitoring, and uh, more importantly, governance and alignment with the sustainable development goals. Just uh, for uh, your information, there is no uh, indicator on the sustainable development goals, but it is a CR who have advanced uh, for 40%, uh, nearly 40% of sustainable development goals. So this group has helped in the 
things, a profile uh, of AMR and also and, uh, advocacy activities. But more importantly, it also did uh, quite substantial background uh, research and consultation and developed six discussion papers which went into public consultation during the months of uh, June, July, August. And uh, based on that uh, discussion paper and the feedback that we obtained from this publication, the currently the group is uh, bracing to write and its recommendations uh, and uh, report for uh, consideration again through a very inclusive process which will again go into a public consultation for feedback so who in, is normally interested in the work of this group the iacg and this is just based on feedback we received from public consultation on the six discussion papers which were sent in two separate uh, uh, period uh, time between June and July for the first three discussion papers on national action plans, research and development, and surveillance, you know, the upper part of this slide. And uh, also the lower part showed the second set of uh, discussion papers, consultation on communication, optimized use, and governance. So as so you can see, the respondents were 43 in the first set and 38 in the second and it ranges between member states, civil society and NGOs, individuals, and others include like foundations and uh, the academic uh, societies and the private sector. One important uh, issue uh, that we found, very few members from civil society organizations from what we call the SAUs, uh, provided feedback and this has been a concern also for the ICG because AMR unlike so many other uh, you know important you know, diseases it is the uh, equally a problem for the United States as it equally for uh, Malawi or Swaziland so it's really a very uh, massive problem that cut across uh, all parts of the world so the concern is emanating out of that. So when we look into the major timelines and uh, of this group, as I was mentioning earlier, there is uh, drafting uh, of recommendation is going on and there will be anchoring of this uh, through uh, what we call a, a call to action event that will be held in Ghana in November. And then the ICG will meet to finalize its first draft report in December which again will go out for public consultation online as well as regional consultations for the months of January and February and then the second draft will be developed and it will finally be submitted to the Secretary General. The biggest question for the, I, the ICG is already these are reports which included recommendations what the world needs to do around AMR. So what is the uniqueness of the ICG recommendations. That is a challenge that the group is entertaining and it's attempting to make its recommendations are innovative for breakthrough actions and also trying to make its recommendations disruptive for what is not working as well as catalytic really to uh, facilitate the implementation of existing recommendations. So in general, you know, these groups are really now going and working toward this uh, developing and delivering their uh, report. And uh, we also identified critical areas, you know, for the ICG recommendations, in, starting, you know, that cut across human, animal, plant, and environment. And uh, at the, with a real focus in bringing impact at country level. And uh, these critical areas include accountability, coordination, financing, governance, implementation, integration and mainstreaming, impact and result at country level, and more importantly, regulation and enforcement. So finally, we would like to invite you to visit our website and also uh, send us email if you have any questions.
over and thank you. Uh, thank you, Hiren, for explaining so well why it is urgently important to control AMR that is having a devastating effect on global health and also what the Interagency Coordination Group on AMR is doing to counteract it. Uh, our next panelist is Mrs. Garans Fanny Upham. Unfortunately, she's traveling right now due to a pre-scheduled engagement. So she requested me to share with you all what she said in conversation with me about the connect between antimicrobial resistance, food security, and climate change when I had met her in Geneva a few days ago. Now, please listen to some excerpts from that conversation. Antibiotic resistance comes from the food chain as well as in overuse in human health, overuse in animal health, and in particular from waste disposal because when you dump antibiotics into the environment, as we all do in, in India normally, or because 90% of drug production comes from India, if we dump antibiotics in the environment, in the water and the rivers, if we dump animal waste, you know, the part that the industry cannot use into the environment, that's even worse because we're dumping biological material that already has resistance to antibiotics. Yes. We know in the case of tuberculosis, which is a bacterial disease, that we have had resistance to drugs for many years. And just after the UN World Health Assembly, the UN General Assembly on tuberculosis last week, we know that drug resistant, MDR, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, is a very big problem internationally. And that XDR tuberculosis is coming on the horizon. Now, let me switch back to something. How is it, how is it, I'll be critical, that we do not talk about prevention? Because what's happening today in South Africa, in India, in Russia, all over the world, is that you have naive patients who contract drug-resistant tuberculosis. In other words, it's not like they didn't take the drugs. It's not like the doctors didn't treat them properly. It's that they caught a disease that is drug resistant from contacts, could be public transportation, it's often in the hospital, in the communities, in the slums, and I would say globally we're doing very little on prevention and infection prevention control. The international community is talking about new antibiotics, talking about market incentive, investing for new antibiotics. But you know, I'll quote Dominique Monet from the European Centers for Disease Control. If we have new antibiotics and we don't deal with infection prevention control, it is like putting oil on the fire. You know, in 2008 at the WHO, a great, great uh, lady from Senegal, Awa Edara Kane, started the group Agizar, which is dealing with anti-microbial uh, resistance in the food chain. That's the group that's dealing with it. And this year, um, with the WHO, they published the guideline on critical use of antibiotics uh, uh, last November. Now, let's, it's very important to look at that, Agizar. Now, let me tell you a story that she told me, you know. She said, look, people think that they can be protected from AMR because they say, oh, I don't take antibiotics. They think at an individual basis. She said, well, I have news for you. For you. Tomorrow you go buy tomatoes that come from Italy, which has a lot of drug resistance. You can have the drug resistant bug on your tomato. You're going to inject, you know, you're going to eat your tomato. Of course, what happens when you get into your gut a bacteria species that has acquired a gene of resistance? Well, the bacteria, they don't live as individual, you know, they don't follow the uh, ultra-liberal economics that we are taught, you know, they, they tend to act as a group. So bacteria will share, will share the gene of drug resistance, right? So you can catch, you can develop an, an infection from a number of bacteria that you have in your gut, could be E. coli, could be a number of bacteria, 
just because you ate a tomato. So it's, I think that EMI is not well explained to the public. People think that it's the individual patient who is resistant. It's not the individual patient, it's the bacteria. And the problem is we live in the world of bacteria. Some of them are dangerous to us. And the problem is that bacteria that can give you infections can share gene resistance. So again, you can, nobody, absolutely nobody is immune, no matter how wealthy or how, uh, in what country you live, you are at the mercy of drug resistance via the environment, via the food chain, via an hygienic food chain. You know, there's been studies showing that, I think it was like half of samples of chicken sold in the supermarket in the U.S. had E. coli. So tomorrow, if you have gene resistance and E. coli, you know, it can spread, which is why, again, the G20 had a bio defense exercise um, this week uh, focusing on E. coli. Happy to see um, a few weeks ago an article that came out in Planetary Health by leading authors who said, wait a minute now, if you look at the statistics, the, the parts of the world that have the lowest use of antibiotics, like Africa, have their highest rate of resistance. Why is it? Rather say, the problem today is contagion. contagion. In other words, AMR as epidemic is spread via two things. One is the environment, the water supply, the bad waste disposal, polluting the water supply, the lack of sewer and sanitation polluting the water supply. And the other aspect is infection prevention and control that is very weak in health system. Now, to the extent we get more weather events, more extreme weather events, we're going to get two things. We're going to get thousands of people being uh, brought into healthcare systems. So we're not focusing on the right thing, which is we need to really reinforce hygiene because otherwise drug resistant infection will be spread from one patient to healthcare workers, to other patients, to other healthcare workers. And you know, to really understand, I mean, people see Ebola on the news. People understand, well, any drug resistant infection, whether it's antibiotic resistance, whether it's uh, antiretroviral resistant, you know, because like 17% of new cases in South Africa of HIV are drug resistant, right? We have that problem too. Malaria resistant, I mean, they may not be as contagious as Ebola, but the effect will be the same because if we cannot treat them, those people are going to die. And the biggest thing that is threatening worldwide in terms of AMR is epidemic of enterobacteria, in other words, bacteria that gives diarrheal disease. This is, this is an immediate threat because of antibiotic resistance. And what do this means? This means that we are not, I'd say we, you know, globally, we have not paid sufficient attention to investment in proper sewers, portable water, right? And basic hygiene in hospitals and in the community. And my dream is to try to get an international movement on that because this is really the way to tackle AMR. And from there, I'd like to go back to the TB thing because, you know, there we have, we have a, a, a major TB problem with estimated 10 million cases a year. It's huge. If you look at the pictures, there's a, there's a, a great picture of a tuberculosis dispensary from Pakistan in the WHO document, and it shows there's no airflow in the room, People don't have any mask. There's nothing to collect spit, spitting. So we're not dealing with prevention. You, you, you go see a major new hospital in France or in the US, you will see a very crowded, stuffy waiting room. No natural ventilation. You go to India, you find no natural ventilation. You go to Africa, you find no natural ventilation. And I have news for you. In 2009, the WHO put out a document natural ventilation for healthcare systems. Natural ventilation is much cheaper and more efficient than very, very fancy 
negative pressure rooms. You know, so you can have, I'm not against fancy technology, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that at the minimum, in poor settings, we should go back to the basics of natural airflow, which we knew centuries ago. It's part of human knowledge. You know, so if we want to prevent flu epidemic in the winter, and we want to decrease the risk that people contract tuberculosis, you know, besides building good housing, but that's my other thing, you know, we also need to have waiting rooms in which people are not crowded. We need to have natural ventilation, and it's not talked about. Infection prevention control is not in the document on tuberculosis. It's all in treatment. Well, I'm all for treatment, but we have to do prevention. What an eye-opener regarding the wide and devastating ramifications of antimicrobial resistance and the need to go back to the basics by focusing more on prevention and control, irrespective of which part of the world we live in. Just to let you know, the full interview of Garans is available on the CNS website. We now open the question and answer session and invite the participants for their comments and questions. You can click on the Q&A box, which you must be seeing on your screen, and then type in your question. If you wish to speak, please click on the virtual hand you see on the screen. So now we begin the open session. Uh, we have a question from Beryl Osinde. And Hele, there are a lot of questions for you now. Uh, Beryl says that drug-resistant cases are replicated at the community level because people lack information. How then do we bridge the gap between governments, research institutions, and the communities? That is, how do we have this multi-sectoral approach to ensure that AMR management becomes sustainable? Is there a way in which information can be packaged in a simple manner that the very lowest community members who use antibiotics can understand drug resistance? Haley, will you would you like to answer the question, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think this question is um, a clear uh, no-brainer question. Um, uh, everything at the community level is matters and particularly how we are using antibiotics because it starts from the individual uh, number one not to use when uh, antimicrobials particularly antibiotics are not needed when all we are also instructed by clinicians uh, to use them we have to use them properly and appropriately uh, finishing the course that we are given and also really to uh, make sure that if we are all communities you know dealing also with you know agriculture and animals we make sure that all the precautionary uh, measures are taken well so there is no question that communicating in the uh, tailored uh, local context manner for uh, communities, families, individuals is, is a way forward. But of course, at, as it was picked up in the question, there is gap between the higher policymakers and the low end, end, end users. So how to fit that gap? So I think that is why we need all this uh, consultations and uh, really you know candid you know discussion and reflection how to make sure that we actually about the future and uh, communication is one critical area as I was trying to mention in my uh, presentation for CG that will be up what type of conditions out we have to wait and see I totally agree uh, that uh, engaging communities is a solution. Over. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from 
Zafar Kidwai of Star in Bangladesh, uh, who wants to know if there were any discussions around AMR on the uh, at UNGA in two, uh, 2018, which was held last month. But so, I mean, there was no high level meeting on mm -hmm. AMR in the 2018 UNGA. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, there were two, the TB1 and the NCD1. And as you may have seen also from the TB uh, declaration, uh, AMR is a, a really uh, very well uh, featured. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, there is one uh, event that was organized by the uh, Center for Disease Control uh, of the US. In, co in collaboration with a number of other agencies, including uh, the Gates Foundation and Welcome Trust, where they launched a year-long uh, solicitation of, of commitment around AMR. Apart from that, to my knowledge, uh, there, are, there were not many events in the ANGA 2018. Okay. Uh, Haley, I have a question. Oh, from you, for you. Mm. Uh, what is your message for the WHO Antibiotic Awareness Week, uh, which is going to take place next month? Are mm. other sectors which are engaged in agriculture, uh, climate uh, change, are they going to engage with this week's observation? Yeah, so I would encourage you to go and visit the website. There is a website uh, for this Antibiotic Awareness Week, uh, which actually is done uh, through uh, with a tripartite partnership with FAO and Organization of Animal Health mm -hmm. that covers both uh, human as well as animal health and agriculture. So there are so many uh, useful documentations and for the antibiotic awareness, encourage you to uh, take it. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Supriya, uh, who uh, says that we hear of multi-sectoral collaboration in TB, in NCDs, in SDGs, and also in AMR. So do we need a restructuring or a reorganization of the departments and ministries so that multi-sectoral collaboration becomes a reality? Yeah, so multi-sectoral collaboration is a big word and it's a big uh, concept also because it entails dealing with uh, multiple uh, entities with their own uh, guiding principles with their own you know most importantly uh, management and funding streams but probably uh, dealing with one issue or with one uh, situation in this case antimicrobial resistance and health in general is a multi-sectoral issue because health is linked with uh, you know all our uh, surroundings it's not really about treating uh, illnesses and curing illnesses it's also preventing it's also making sure there is adequate uh, food you know safe food as well as uh, good environment uh, housing so it's really uh, a broader issue. So that's why the sustainable development you know, goals, uh, which acknowledge you know, the need for multi-sectoral uh, collaboration uh, would really help us. But at this point in time, I don't think there will be one size fits for all sort of solution, saying that let's dismantle what is existing there and let's create new structures. I don't think that will be the solution, but I think it has to be looked into case by case uh, in a much more uh, robust manner to see what do we mean by multi-sectoral engagement or multi-sectoral involvement or multi-sectoral collaboration, to what extent, and what are more the low-hanging fruits you know, to pick through such collaboration or through such uh, engagement and partnership, or is there any platform that we can use uh, to, uh, you know, further such collaboration? So I think it's really a, a very diverse uh, situation that we have to look in a much more detail. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Sunita Srinivas from Institute of Public Health India uh, is working on initiating a project on antibiotics stewardship in 27 primary health centers in Karnataka uh, via the Karuna Trust. She wants to know, is it possible to get technical inputs from any of the IACG members? So the ICG members uh, will not provide the technical support, but I uh, encourage you to contact uh, the WHO because you are uh, you want to run the stewardship program in health facilities. Uh, you can contact uh, you know the India WHO office. That could be one uh, entry point, or if you could send me email, I can connect you. Okay, that, that, that would be great because in any case, we'll be sharing your uh, email ID with them. And um, uh, another question from Rahul uh, is that the conference of parties of UN Framework Convention on Climate Change will be held in December 2018. Is the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR engaged with lobbying on AMR and climate linkages? So, uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. The Conference of Parties of UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, mm -hmm. UNFCCC, will yes. be held in December. So, is the uh, Interagency Coordination Group on AMR engaged with lobbying on AMR and climate linkages? Uh, no, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. But the ISCG in its deliberations is closely looking into the ICC's you know, evolution. And also because uh, some people uh, say there are more similarities between climate change and antimicrobial resistance. And there is uh, uh, some uh, engagement really to understand you know, what are the lessons uh, we can build on uh, what has been achieved so far by the climate change uh, uh, stakeholders. Okay. Uh, I'm once again requesting the participants to please uh, keep on sending your questions. You can click on the Q&A box. Uh, please do not write in the chat box, but in the Q&A box, which you must be seeing on your screen, and then type your question in. Uh, we have a question from Maria. Uh, who says that people living with HIV become resistant to antiretroviral drugs. That is why we, they need second line therapy. How is it that drug resistance to ARVs is not that big an issue for public health in terms of perception and advocacy as it is in the case of tuberculosis? So I think we have to uh, look into the data that is uh, already existing. So the tuberculosis drug resistance surveillance has been there for quite so, uh, some time and the data is also being generated for a long time, unlike HIV, which uh, been uh, you know, a recent uh, phenomenon. But having said that, you know, there is emerging data showing the concern and uh, of uh, resistance among uh, ARVs. Uh, particularly, you know, uh, those who, who, who fail, you know, treatment. And uh, this also goes with the duration of the use of the drugs compared to the TB, ARVs are more recent events. So that also contributes to uh, what seemingly seems less of a problem, which may not be the case. Uh, the next question is from Surendra Karki from Nepal. Uh, Suren says, uh, health has been the main strategy to tackle the problem of AMR. However, in many developing countries, surveillance system in animal health, human health has been, is being taken care of, but not taken care of, but probably more focus on it. But surveillance system in animal health is in preliminary stages compared to human health component. In this scenario, how can we bring in animal health component together in the process? Do international organizations and development partners increase funding in animal health? So resource is always a problem. Resource availability is also always important to make a difference in a certain problem. 
Um, so uh, what I called earlier in my presentation, you know, the tripartite partnership between WHO, FAO, and Organization of Animal Health, and now with uh, increasing engagement with United Nations Environment Program, is making sure that you know these agencies are working in a multi-sectoral platform and uh, that would also include you know really making sure that they develop you know a joint work plan with resource mobilization that potentially could also address but i think in general resources are important the resources are definitely in shortage so I think how to finance the future AMR is also another critical area that the interagency group is looking into carefully. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Neeti Jadeja. Neeti, would you like to ask the question yourself? Yes, Neeti, would you like to ask? All right, I, I, she had typed in her question, so I will ask on her behalf. Uh, she wants to know if there is a list of priority antibiotics to be monitored in the environmental ecosystem. Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. Is there a need for that? I mean, we have already, as I put on my... Um, presentation, we have uh, critically uh, important antimicrobials, mm -hmm. you know, for human health uh, that should be in any way be protected and also monitored. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, before we end the webinar, please join me to pay homage to a longtime environment rights crusader who sacrificed his life recently to save the river Ganga. Dr. Gyanda Sagarwal or Swami Gyan Swarup Sanand studied at the University of California, Berkeley. He taught engineering at I, the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and was a dedicated crusader to save the river Ganga. After fasting for 112 days, subsisting just on water and honey, he gave up water too and sadly passed away a few days ago with his demands for river conservation and ecology left unmet. This is a grim reality check on how far behind we are lagging on climate justice issues and an irreparable loss indeed. We now come to the close of the webinar. My sincere thanks to all our panelists for a very enriching discussion as well as we are grateful to the participants for their engagement with the webinar. And last but not the least, special thanks to our guest moderator, Ashok Ramsaru. As always, the link to the webinar recording and podcast will be shared with all the participants and will soon be available in the public domain. Bye and have a good day.